All right, let's go back into Mongo and let's actually search for some data. So we want to use MyDB, which is our collection that we have. And we want to actually go in and um, use the find on MyDB. Now I'm going to put in just MyDB find, which isn't going to return anything because that's not correct. I'm looking for persons. And when I do persons, all right, if we do db.person.find, we'll get back a list of all of the, uh, in the collection person, all of the persons. Some things to point out is that uh, the database has a underscore ID field that acts as a unique ID for each document. The ID field is what I'd call an intelligent key. It has to be created by the database. And it basically is a combination of an instance and a bunch of timestamp informations as a big long number. So this means that when you use this ID, it's not just a pure ID that has no meaning. That's a good thing when you have IDs with no meaning to them and they're not ordered. Even better is a thing like a UUID where the ID can be generated independently of the database. As soon as you generate or require your IDs to be generated in the database, you have a guaranteed bottleneck at the level of the database. Also, you've guaranteed that you can't build data remotely, as in a detached database, and then merge that data in, which in our modern day world of things like cell phones turns out to be a really useful thing and one of the primary reasons why I like using UUIDs for data as in the application can create IDs as necessary and there's no collision and there's no dependency on having a persistent connection to a centralized authority. The centralized authority for IDs turns out to be a huge bottleneck in any concurrent system and it's something that you really really want to avoid. So when we look at something like CouchDB and we're poking at CouchDB as as a truly distributed database, you'll know that you ne almost never, I wouldn't say never, but almost never use a sequence or a database generated ID. All the IDs you use for your data are UUIDs that can be built remotely. Now, find can take parameters. So we can do, come up here and we can put in squiggle back at name. Well, I hope I got the syntax right, and I did for once on my first try. And you'll notice that it returns just those documents that match that particular thing. Now, you can pull in multiple keys. Basically, it's anded together so that I can have multiple things that I'm searching for. But when we look at the query capabilities, we're limited to basically a set of operations that are anded together and you're building your own parse tree since this isn't really a language you're doing JSON and you're passing it parameters it's not like you can build you know I want Thomas Jefferson or Thomas Bailey or Thomas Ridley okay so you're quite limited in terms of what the query language is and this query language that J or uh, MongoDB supports is also the same that it's going to use for doing updates and deletes and it's useful to have a query language, but this one is pretty flat. That's what I would say. There's no internal capabilities. I can't say something like, oh, I'd really like to query this table and find all the things between June and July or March and August of 1918, and then take that set of information. And for those rows, I'd like to sum up the number of something or other. You can't do that. If you want to do something like that, you're going to have to do all of your querying on your client side to actually do the processing of the data and filter it post querying it. So that's kind of the stuff for find. Let's take a look at doing the same kind of a find now in the Go code. All right, now back to the Go code. And uh, the Go code has the same stuff in it that it did before for connection and the person data type. And if we scroll down in it and we'll look at what we do after that, 
Uh, first of all, we connect to the person. Uh, I think I've misspelled person there, but person uh, collection inside MyDB. And we set up a filter with this Bison D name of Thomas Jefferson. That's the same thing that I did from the command line. And I've commented out some options that I'm going to use later that in another example. But here it is that we do filter and then we decode the result into this result collection of data. Now, um, basically we print it out, which is going to give us the same results that you saw from the command line. Some things to point out here. First of all, bison, D. Um, bison is a binary data type built on top of JSON. Basically, it's JSON, JavaScript object notation, without converting it to text. And Bison is was developed by MongoDB so that they didn't have to serialize, parse, unparse data as they're sending it back and forth. Basically, they could gain a little bit of efficiency by using JSON data, but having it kept in binary form and serialize it. Now, to do that, they have to have some constraints that we have to be aware of is that uh, when you have something like a number, like an int age in this, that you have to use the same encoding on both sides. And there are all sorts of encodings. They use a standard integer encoding, little endian, which is the order of the bytes. And uh, Go provides good utilities for encoding and decoding numbers. Their integers are always 64-bit integers. So they actually represent an integer data type. If you look at what you have in JavaScript, you don't actually have integers. You have floating point numbers that have no decimal places, and consequently you have 53 or 52 bits, depending on the exact machine, whether you're talking, well, depending on the machine, 52 to 53 bits of integer values when you have integers, as opposed to an actual 64-bit integer. This means that Bison actually has more data types in it than uh, JSON does. And we can take advantage of that. But since the two are used with lots of code interchangeably, like the command line interface for uh, MongoDB is actually written using a JavaScript interpreter, it's still using floating point numbers with 53 bits of accuracy as opposed to their actual underlying bison data at 64 bits for integer accuracy. So I can actually go into Go code where I'm actually using binary data and I can create integers that are bigger than what I can display in their own command line utility and cause all sorts of interesting results by doing that. I say interesting as in it'll break things. So you do need to be aware of that and some limitations. Uh, floating points are the same format. They're using uh, IEEE 784 format for the floating points. So they're floating point numbers. They are not something nice like PAC Decimal and COBOL where you actually have accuracy for all floating points. I think one of the reasons why COBOL is still around and used by banks is that it does do all of its floating points as PAC Decimal. And you'll also find that true to be in some databases like Oracle. And it's used tremendously in financial applications for that very reason, as in its floating point numbers are decimal accurate floating point numbers. And that makes a difference for banking transactions. So let's go over and take a look at the uh, other one where we fetch back multiple, multiple uh, things. And that was fetch one doc. And let's go into fetch many. And again, we're going to see there's the same connection stuff. And we connect to the same database. But instead, remember those options that I had commented out. And instead of doing a filter, I'm going to do an empty filter. You notice it just says Bison D with no criteria. And I'm going to say for my options that I'm going to set a limit of two documents that I'm getting back. So this is one of our, our few options for uh, data and collective data work when we do a find. We don't have a lot of summing or things like that that we can do in Mongo, but we can filter it and we can limit the number that we get back. 
So we do the find with the empty filter, and this time when we're doing it, okay, I'm going to come back to this piece of code here in just a minute. But let's look at what we do with the find. We have to have a cursor now where we're going to do next. We're going to pull back a single person, and we get them one at a time, and we append the results to this result list. Result list is a slice of results that we've declared, and that's what we're building. We don't get back all the results. We have to append it ourselves. We get back one document at a time. And the one document at a time is a limitation in the MongoDB communication protocol. It doesn't bunch it up and send a bunch. It does a single network request for each document and then you get to decode it, process it, however you want. Now, I've set a limit of only getting two documents. That's not very many. But, um, yeah, you get, you get a limit of, of one document transferred at a time in its protocol. Now, you'll notice down here at the bottom, I do errors, log fatal, and um, we close the context that we're doing for this, this cursor. But there's no disconnect. The disconnect was actually done up here. And this was done so that we actually fixed the problem with how you do disconnects and the possibility of exiting the program before you've disconnected from Mongo. And the way to do that in Go is I create this local function, which is called disconnect. And that disconnect colon equal declares that and creates this lambda function but I have a pointer to that function with the disconnect variable. And all it does is it takes the global information of client and it performs a disconnect from the database so that at any point where I do log fatal or I exit the program, it's going to go ahead and disconnect. And then right after the connection, I have this defer disconnect. Defer disconnect happens at the exit of the block, which in this case is the main program. So I guarantee that although I've got log fatals in here that will exit, that these things will turn around and disconnect from the database, even if I have not proceeded with the rest of the program. So in terms of Go, this is a nice feature, having this defer and this capability of doing this. And this is also how you go about building local functions inside another function that have global access to data and scope. And basically what Go does is anytime you build a local function like this, it creates a closure for that function that attaches it to the data of the outside function. So you can actually take these things and you can pass this function and still access the global data because you have a complete closure here. So a bunch of useful things about Go and how you fetch back multiple pieces of data in Mongo. Um, I'm running late today, so I don't think I'm going to get to delete and other things right now. You're going to get some more videos later today that have the other pieces. But do take a look at the, um, the document that I did that I've collected the different Mongo commands that I normally use into a single document. And it gives you a nice cheat sheet in a couple pages of all the different things that you do from the command line in Mongo. And once you've matched up kind of the command line stuff with what you're seeing in the Go code, the rest of the Go code and the command line, it becomes fairly obvious how you interface to Mongo. There's not a lot of, of syntax and capabilities, and it's not a language. You're working in JavaScript or you're building function calls, and consequently you're quite limited in terms of what you can actually do. Um, that has its advantages and disadvantages, but it is quite limited. It's not a language. It's just a set of parameters.